Dear brothers and sisters and viewers of Conversation, welcome to the next edition of Conversation. Uh, there's a little melancholy about today's episode because this is the last of this season's conversations about uh, the Quran, Ramadan 2021. But we have a lot of reasons to be joyful about it. And the most important one is that we have with us an incredibly distinguished uh, spiritual leader with us, Imam Faisal Rauf, uh, who is going to talk about uh, Quran and spirituality with us today. Uh, Imam Faisal does not need much introduction. I consider him one of the imams of America. Uh, he is the founder president of Cordoba House. He has written three books, uh, which I will during the course of this conversation illustrate, and you can see what the books are. Uh, but today we are going to talk about uh, Quran and how it can become a way to become spiritually enriched. Uh, and so without uh, further taking away time from our guests, uh, Assalamu alaikum Imam Faisal and welcome to Conversations. Wa alaikum salam, my dear brother Professor Muqtadar. It's a pleasure to be with you again and always a pleasure to see your beautiful smiling countenance. Thank you very much. Uh, Imam Faisal is not only a friend, but I also consider him my teacher and guide. Uh, so this is a great honor to me. So th my first question to you is a softball. You know? uh, we Muslims have a very beautiful relationship with the Quran. Uh, they use it to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by recitation. It is necessary to perform the ritual prayers uh, without which we, without at least reciting Surah Fatiha, our prayers are incomplete. Uh, and then it is also a book which is a source of laws. Uh, some people say 5% of the Quran is uh, the basis of Islamic Sharia. But today I want to talk about Quran as a spiritual uh, guide. So in your spiritual life, how do you see the Quran? The Quran is for Muslims the way Jesus is for Christians. You know, uh, Christians regard Jesus as the word, the, uh, the, the word of, of God becoming flesh, so to speak. Uh, and, and they symbolically uh, perform the, uh, the sacrament of the, uh, uh, of, the, um, of the Eucharist, where they symbolically take into themselves the wafer and the little sip of wine it's presumably the, the body of Jesus into their beings. For Muslims, the Quran is the word of God made into human sound. Because everything, everything in creation is essentially God's speech. Allah says in the Quran as much. He says when he wants to do something, just says to it be and become. So everything is essentially a word. Uh, even the Quran describes Jesus as a word from uh, from Allah that He cast into Al Qaha, which means like it. You can say He spoke it to Mary, to Maryam, or He, you know, cast it in, into Mary. So everything is God's speech, but but the Quran is is God's speech in human sound, and therefore when we listen to the Quran, when, to re when we recite the Quran, we ask it to speak ingesting the Quran into ourselves. It is a, a way of uh, um, taking it into ourselves. However, the extent to which we take it, I mean, is, is not a, a, a passive act. It is an active act on our part. We, in other words, we can, we can hear the Quran just kid and superficially and doesn't penetrate us. So it requires a, a state of receptivity, of openness to receiving the, 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 uh, the power of the Quran, both as a, as, a, um, as, a, um, as a ray of light and energy into our beings, uh, as well into its meanings, into our, into our minds, uh, uh, you know, uh, its effect on our souls and hearts, um, and we process its meanings, but it operates at all of these at the, all of these levels. 
And that's why there's a battle between the, the debate uh, of that the, the Christians used to have as to whether Jesus, as the word of God, was created by God or co-equal, or, you know, or co-eternal with God. And if you notice in the history of Islam, the same argument developed. Is the Quran created or is it as the word of God? Is it co-eternal with God? And of course, you know, the, the difference between the Ash'ari theologians and the, and the, and the Mu'tazili on some of these issues, we may not n need to go into that today. But to just to point out that, the, that the, the, the narrative that happens across religious lines is very often the same. And uh, you were talking to me earlier uh, as how you were speaking to somebody about, um, about non-Muslims and how they should read the Quran. Uh, I have also uh, urged my congregation to, to read the other scriptures that came before us because the Quran as much as practically tells us to do that. It, it, it says that we are to believe in the... Uh, in the um, in the book that was revealed to Muhammad and the book that was sent down before this, which you refers know. specifically to the evangel of Jesus. So uh, it is important for us to, um, to, 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 to understand the Quran in all of its manifestations. It is, a, as you mentioned, a book of law. It is a book of historical stories, a book of reminders of what happened to the other prophets. It's a warning. It is a light and a blessing to us. Um, it is all of these things. And the ultimate thing that we should try to be is to become um, walking Qurans. Uh, as you know, this expression was coined by the Prophet's wife, Aisha, when one of the succeeding generation, the Tabi'i, who was not a you know, Tabi'i, meaning a person who was too young to, to really know the Prophet well enough or born generation right after that, he came to say to Aisha because she was barely 20 when the prophet died and she lived to i think to, to, to over 60 and uh, so he, she asked her what was the prophet like and she said he was the walking quran and since uh, the prophet's uh, sunnah is something we should we should uh, strive to 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 adopt in all its manners uh, this is something which i take to heart uh, personally uh, we, we now in our cordoba school with our sunday school i have uh, mandated uh, you know, our uh, 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 teachers that their objective is essentially to educate these young children to become to the extent of their capacity walking Qurans. That's, that's the, that's the, that's the um, ultimate, that's the ambition. So we should all uh, strive to that uh, in terms of our own personal discipline and education. I actually wrote a paper called What is Enlightenment? An Islamic Perspective. You know, kind of working on Foucault, who had also written an article called What is Enlightenment? So I took this comment by Aisha radiallahu anha that, that the Prophet ﷺ was the walking Quran. And I said, Quran is for Khan, the capacity to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is not good. So this discernment is enlightenment for people to be able to make moral judgment is what enlightenment is about. So yes, uh, I mean, there is this spiritually inspiring side of, of the Quran, but coming to this topic of the co-eternal nature of the Quran. So, so there's this profound debate. You know, some people say that if you believe that the Quran is created, you are probably out of the faith. But if the Quran is co-eternal with God, uh, then are we in possession of something divine, like some self of God, you know, something from his nafs itself, if this is something which is part of God. And so, so is our, it kind of changes how we relate to this text, right? It becomes even more worthy of reverence than it gets at the moment. Well, I mean, look, uh, the Quran in, describe, in the various verses which, where, where Allah describes the creation of Adam, the creation of man, the, our creation. Uh, he says, we created you from a mudra mukhallaqatin wa ghayri mukhallaqatin. We created you, Adam, man, humankind, from a chunk or a bite. Mudra means like a, a bite or a chunk of something created and of something uncreated. Now, 
how do we wrap our heads around that? I've grappled with that. Does that mean that we are co-eternal with God? Yeah. You see, um, well, it, and, and this is why Ibn Arabi, Sheikh Ibn Arabi talks about, you know, uh, the, the unknowable God, you know, mm -hmm. the, 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 in fact, I think he may have been the one who introduced the idea of Tanzih and Tashbih into our yeah. understanding of, of, of God, that God is... Yeah. is uh, he is beyond any description, unlike anything. That's the idea of Tanzi. Then we have Tashbi, that Allah is, you know, Rahman, like all the attributes, Jamil, you know, Atuf, etc. All these attributes are human attributes. So he says that the, 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 Allah is the unknowable God we, we can't even know about. But, uh, and, and his description of, of, of how the, from, the, from the unknowable God, a knowable God, Kind of effulged out of it, Allah's <laughs> noble God, and then, and then, it, in terms of that, because God knew He was going to create us, therefore, at least at some level, call it archetypal existence or whatever, we're already in the minds of God. But the idea of Krishna and Christian, as be, when you try to like really wrap your head around it, you reach the point where we just have to follow the prophet's advice. Don't go beyond that because if you do. You're gonna like fall into into committing committing offenses against God in terms of the way you think about it. And that is why also we there's a limit. I mean, this is why people of spiritual our spiritual teachers have ta taught us that there is a limit to what the intellect, the human intellect, can reach. And beyond that, it's only the the human spirit, the human soul, that can reach. And uh, those of us who have participated in spiritual activities, we have undergone, depending upon the individual, spiritual experiences, dreams, visions that, that teach us information directly that cannot be acquired intellectually. And... Um, and when we have those uh, perception, direct perceptions of truth regarding a certain issue or a certain matter, they, they inform us. They give us information that our minds then can, can accept and understand. Um, you know, for example, I, I had a, a vivid dream many years ago uh, that I was enclosed in a, what looked like a, uh, like, like, like a womb. And that, that inside this, this, this sphere that I was in was darkness, and everything around that was light. And between me and the outside, the surface, was a straw on my mouth. And every time I said, Allah, I saw an actual chunk of light go through the straw and come inside of me. And this image and this vision, this dream that I had, made me understand and realize in a visceral way, direct way, how dhikr, saying Allah, reciting the Quran, actually gives us light, a spiritual light, a radiance which you see on people's faces who, who are practiced in this type of activity. So it, it, it not only taught me a piece of knowledge, but it had a whole set of ramifications on how I looked at things. This is why they speak of ilm ladunni, you know, ilm which is given, you know, which 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 uh, which uh, said Namusa uh, when he tried to when he met Khidr and Allah, you know, describes in the Quran that he met someone whom we taught min ladunna ilm and gave him direct knowledge from us. There's this direct knowledge which was given to the prophets, and this this direct knowledge, which is when you get, is so precious because it trumps. Every other kind of knowledge. There's this famous book called Knowledge by Presence uh, that is uh, written exclusively on this book. But I, I find your reference to Tanzi and Tasbi very interesting. You know, uh, it is seeing with two eyes, right? Seeing with two eyes. One recognizing the transcendence of God, uh, that there is nothing like Laisa Kamislihi. And then also recognizing that uh, uh, this entire creation is, is, is essentially. A, a, a manifestation of the 
of God in some way because he created it all, right? This is also an ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is also a sign of God. But to your reference to, to the question whether we ourselves might be co-eternal, there's enough in the Quran where God says that I have breathed into you, you know, so our soul is like his breath. And he also talks about his signs are on the horizon and his signs are inside the self, yeah. so on the horizon and on the self. So so, so this is exactly where I, I, I would like our conversation to go as to how can we glean from Quran these spiritual nuggets, you know. Uh, we have so made Quran so much of a legalistic document in today's time. Uh, it's all about, you know, aqida, it's all about halal and haram, uh, and not about uh, essentially a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or even trying to, you know, peek into his mysteries. Well, I mean, look, just to refer to your previous question about, you know, the Quran being created or uncreated. Uh, I quoted the Quran itself, which says that Allah cre created us from a chunk of something and something uncreated. So if you tie it in with the verse of the Quran, which says that Allah breathed into Adam, breathed to us on, from his ruh, from his ruh, his ruh is uncreated. But the act of breathing into us of the ruh is an act of creation. So, I mean, I, I see the Quran as a parallel to that because the Quran, the Quran, um, I, I'm going to, this is not a 100% accurate statement, but you know what I mean, is a byproduct of the existence of, of, of man. And as if man did not exist, there would be no need for a Quran to, 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 to be brought forth. So, in terms of the in terms of the um, of the the order of creation, in the sense that Ibn Arabi talks about the the, the the procedure, the process of creation, the creation of man comes before, prior to the existence of the Quran. Mm -hmm. So, so to me, to, to to me, the Quran comes, of course, to educate man, to inform man, because Allah says in the Quran when He expels Adam and Eve from paradise. He said, I will send you my signs and, you know, those who, you, who follow my, my, you know, my message and so forth will, will you know, will, will be saved, so to speak. So, so the, the, the creation of man and the uh, expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise are all prior, you know, the, to, to, to the coming down of all of God's prophets and messengers and scriptures. So the the raison d'etre of, of, of all scripture, including the Quran, is to, is to help man in the sense of, you know, mankind come back and win back entry into, into paradise. So, so therefore, I see the, the, the Quran reflecting aspects of, of, of humankind. So just as humankind is, man is created, but he's created from a component which is uncreated. And therefore, I believe the Quran also, being the word of God, it is a created entity. It contains within it something of the nature of God that is uncreated. So it blends both of this in the same way that, that human being. But it is a created entity, but a component of it is from God. This is why it is for us a shifa, it is a, it is a healing for our, you know, our stresses. And uh, all of us who have, I mean, I myself and those of us in my, my congregation, um, when we do, uh, uh, you know, our recitation of the Quran or our, our dhikr, uh, we actually feel that the, the world stress get reduced. Ultimately, Quran is a function of the relationship between God and his creation, right? It, it exactly. Is, it, 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 it's a connection. Right, and the connection was necessary because the other came into existence. So, so Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala created this entity who is capable of communication, and so the communication begins. But how personal should that communication be? How personal can one's reading of the Quran be? How personal can one's, uh, you know, these days we are so over flooded with information and tafasis and commentaries and teachings, uh, sometimes like 
the Quran is also my Quran, right? So like, can I have a personal understanding and reading of the Quran on the basis of which a personal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be formed? Uh, the answer is yes, in my opinion. And not only that, I think it is a duty for us to establish a personal relationship with the Quran because the Quran for us is also um, uh, figuratively when Allah says that, you know, and hold fast to the rope of Allah. I mean, part of that rope is the Quran. And, and, and the Quran is, is, uh, is something that, that we have to have a personal relationship because it is a tanzil from, it is a, it is a coming down from Allah to us. It came down in this month of Ramadan. Um, it came down in something that, uh, the, we, that, the, that uh, Allah calls Laytul Qadr. Um, so it is something that we, look, I think I've told you the story before that, that, that as a young boy, I learned to practice how to pray. I never felt I was praying. I never felt I had traction because I, I didn't feel I was really witnessing God, witnessing the prophet. And I, and I, and I struggled with these issues. Okay, but once Allah in his magnanimity unveiled his reality to me, I, not only was I awed and blown out of the water and, and felt an incredible feeling of love and all of that stuff, but I also felt a real beginning of a deep and profound relationship with my creator. It's like I could, it's like I could taste his reality. And, and I was overwhelmed by his love and his mercy and, his, um, and I could feel his omniscient power and I could feel his, that he knew everything. And I just knew directly that everything in existence is the way it should be. That was like the beginning, as we say in America, of a, of a long relationship, <laughs> beginning of a long friendship, yeah. right? So for me, that was, that was the moment, but it, it continued. I've had further dreams where I've felt for so the name of God or, and, and all of these add to your, to your, to your relationships. And then many years later, when I had my first dream of the, the prophet, I began to have a personal relationship with him that did that, that could not come out of reading him as a historical figure until then I accepted the prophet as a historical figure, but I never could tell myself sincerely that actually born witness I'd witnessed the prophet. And I wanted that because until I, until I had that experience, I felt every time I said, Ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah, my shadow, my shadow was not complete. It didn't have real traction. But once I saw the Prophet, and I had this relationship with the Prophet, and I had, I, I remember until today, my, my, how I said, oh, this is not the way I thought he would look like. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. I mean, I had, I had, uh, I developed a personal relationship with him. And then later on, Allah blessed me with having a, a, a dream of Jesus Christ. And at that, I began having a relationship with Jesus after that. I didn't have a relationship with Jesus after that. So it's these direct experiences. And when you read the Quran, you're bound to be hit by a passage or by a surah or by whatever. And you can read the you can read that surah or that line a hundred times and will not have any impact. And on the hundred and one time, you'll have that impact. Why? Because the time came, the time was right. You were right for that moment when you read the Quran. Because reading, as I said, reading the Quran is, is not a is a is not a passive thing. It's an active thing, or even hearing the Quran is an active thing. You 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 bring into your reading or hearing of it, your whole wealth of experience. And some part of it will resonate with that idea and bang, you'll have a whole new set of insights. And all of these experiences add to your relationship with the Quran, just as every interaction that you have with a human being builds and develops your relationship with that human being, whether it's your parents, your siblings, whatever. It's the, that interaction. So you'll interact with the Quran. And there's not a single time that I read the Quran when I read it with attention because 
I have to confess. I often read the Quran and my mind wanders. And I said, you know, I wasn't really, wasn't really paying attention. So I read a whole page or a whole passage and I wasn't really thinking about it. I could tell my congregants, you recite, you know, in your, in your salat, uh, you know, Surah Al-Nasr. And at the end, what do we say? What does that mean? It means do tasbih to Allah, glorify him and seek his forgiveness. Now, do we respond to this? Oh, God is commanding me to do tasbih. So let me do tasbih and then we do istighfar. Or just recite it as a formula to just go through the motions of our prayers. Now, that's the difference. The difference is what you bring to it. If I say, you know, I'm going to pay attention to what I'm reading. Oh, here is this is a command. Must let me is command. And then when you do that, look, I have it. This is my has been my interaction with the Quran all my life. And as a result of that, I questioned people. I questioned scholars. I questioned my dad. And when I'm not satisfied, I say, I'm sorry, that's not logic. That doesn't make sense. Like I've asked many scholars, why do we call ourselves Muslims? When Allah never once says, oh, Muslims. He always says, And I said, why do we call ourselves mu'mins when never, it's like saying, okay, my name is Faisal, but you call me Muqtadir. My, my, my name on my, my, my name, okay, I know that my name is this, my, um, but, but why do you call me this name? Why do you never call me by the, my official name? Ya Ladina Aslamu. There has to be some meaning to that. You know what? I've never gotten a satisfactory question from any scholar until I read uh, the, that book which came out a few years ago, Muhammad and the Believers. Yeah, by Fred Donner you're talking about. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, well, the, well the interesting thing is that, I mean, there is a hint in the Quran which uh, I thought of this also. And I feel, you know, so for example, I used to ask myself, why is it that Muslims are always critical of America and not of the Muslim countries uh, for moral and immoral actions. And then I had this horrible realization is because we have moral expectations of the US and so we criticize it when it does immoral <laughs> things, <laughs> right? And we don't have any moral expectations from these countries. So we never bother to criticize it. Similarly, when the Quran says, yes, you have submitted, but you have Iman has not yet entered your heart. You're not yet a mu'min. So I think we are sort of being confessional that, yeah, we say we are Muslim, but we are not really believers still. There is a long way to go to becoming mu'mins. I think it's a very humble thing to say that we are Muslims and we are striving to achieve faith. That's, that's the only way I understand it. Not that the scholars who would provide that explanation, but I think that is what it is. At some point we realize that we, we are like culturally Muslims or we just habitually Muslims or because we are born in certain environment. It's only, uh, that's why I like this born again concept. I think all Muslims should also be, especially Muslims who are born as Muslims should also become born again Muslims. Yani they should take a conscious shahada and then recommit themselves uh, to the faith. Agreed. I mean, look, I, 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 uh, all that, I agree with, with what you're saying here. But going back to the point of building a relationship, what I'm saying is that it, for me, it was my reading of the Quran and observing um, the active, that relationship I had with the Quran said, well, if Allah is calling me a mu'min, then, then and, and criticizes those who are saying that you're not yet mu'mins, you know, you can say you're a Muslim, but you're not planted into your heart. That, that means I need to develop iman in my heart because of my generation, uh, went through a period of time until the, you know, we were born in a period where religion was considered a crutch for the weak. It was not until the 70s that religion became having a comeback, both in the Muslim world and even in the Western, in, in, in America. Uh, until then, you know, even our, our regimes tended to be very non-religious, secular in the anti-religious sense, even like in Turkey yeah. and, and even in Egypt. Uh, even the even the founders of Pakistan were not really they, they were they, they they were religious more in the political community sense rather than in a yeah. than than a than a true sense of this is the, the demand of the faith 
And um, so uh, it, in the 70s, all of a sudden, there was this like, you know, Islam huwa al hal 70s and 80s. Yeah. There was all of a sudden this immense, intense, passionate flag waving of Islam is a solution, Islam is a solution. And I said, where is Iman in all of this? All right. So what has happened is that, and I see these young uh, Muslim, uh, you know, young Muslims, very, very active and taking pride in their Islam. Okay, take pride in your Islam, but where is your Iman? It's very man to take pride. But for me, these observations came out of what you've called a personal interaction with the Quran and an active personal interaction and a personal relationship because it came out of, out of that personal relationship. Now, another person can read the Quran, a contemporary of mine, and not have the same relationship with the Quran that, as I did. So everyone has to have his or her relationship with the Quran. And when you do that, we all have our favorite verses in the Quran, just like we have our favorite, you know, family members. Mm -hmm. We have our favorite verses in the Quran, which we like to read. They, they, they calm us. They give us, they, you know, they, 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 they give us a sense of peace or a sense of calm or a sense of awe, which we love. Um, and all of us, we, we have those experiences. So that's something we should all do. You know, there's a verse in the Quran which says that uh, the Quran has come as a mercy to the believer. You know, and uh, so when when I read that, to me, the question was: so does iman come before our relationship with the Quran, or is iman a product of the relationship with the Quran? I think Iman is a relationship be between us and God. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, the, and the Quran is one of the wasilas, one of the means by which we develop our Iman. But Iman is fundamentally, primarily, the fundamental octave of meaning of Iman is a personal relationship that we have with our own creator, with God. I want to ask you this question uh, about uh, the spiritual and mystical nature of our lives. And there is a lot of controversy historically as well as contemporary about Sufism. And, and when sometimes people say, I mean, some very prominent uh, mainstream scholars will sometimes say things that Sufism is not part of Islam or Sufism is something that is parallel to Islam. Uh, and, and mysticism is not part of Islam. Rahbani, they immediately translated as asceticism and therefore excluded. So, so, but there is a huge tradition of of, of uh, tasawwuf in, in Islamic heritage, and they have done such tremendous work in enlightening us. I mean, we've been talking about Ibn Arabi's understanding of Iman and the Quran. So, so where are you on this? Like, how do you see Sufism and its role uh, for Muslims today in this age? Oh, well, I see it as fundamental. You know, uh, Sheikh Abdul Halim Mahmoud, who was Sheikh Al Azhar, uh, was was an uh, was an admitted was uh, I mean uh, 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 he 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 did not shy from uh, admitting that he was a Sufi practitioner, practicing, of course, in the Shadari Tariq, which is the major tariqah in Egypt. You see, the problem is, is people get stuck on names. Um, one of the things that I remember, you know, one of the reasons why I loved Richard Feynman when I was studying physics, that Richard Feynman, uh, there's a story, when he, when he would see somebody, a physicist, writing an equation on a board, he would not, he would say, something is wrong with that. Not because he worked out the mathematics of it, but because he translated that mathematical formula into its physical reality. And the physical reality didn't make sense to him. That's how he knew it was wrong. So from that, I learned a very profound lesson. Don't look at this at the, at the sound or, 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 or the, 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 the name of something. The name is just an arrow. All right? The reality is what we're after. What is the reality of the religious experience? What is the reality of salah? When Allah says, Ya ladina amanu, uthkurullah dhikran kathira, wa sabbihuhu bukratan wa asila. 
All right. Allah uses the word dhikr and tasbih. Sabbih ism rabbika al-a'la. Huwa alladhi yusalli alaykum. What does it mean for Allah to do salah upon us? To take you out of darkness into light. You can understand the word salah. Oh, what is salah? Salah is you stand this. Da, 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 da. Okay, well, you know, it's like, it's like so we, we get stuck on, on sounds, on narrow definitions, and then we, 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 we think that's what it is. It's like say, you have to understand the phenomenon itself. So those who say, oh, the salah is uh, uh, an Islam, it's like, saying, it's like saying the Hanafi madhab is un-Islamic. Why? Because it did not exist at the time of the Prophet. That's absurd. Okay. Anybody who understands the evolution of, 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 of law, how you have to have one system in each ge geography, uh, and how, the, how these madhahib evolve and why they evolve, realize that, that the, the, so, the, the madhahib are a natural evolution of the religious experience in a community as a community evolves as a community and wants to guide itself in accordance with Allah's dictates. Okay, so to say that, oh, the Shafi'i, there's not such a thing as Shafi'i and Madhab and, and you know, and, um, uh, and uh, Shafi'i and Hanafi and, uh, uh, you know, and Maliki and stuff like that at the time of the Prophet. Therefore, we should not have Madhabs and Madhabs is it's It's, 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 it's such an idiotic statement if you are a person who is a scholar of the faith. The same thing applies to those, the, the same exact logic applies to those who say Sufism is un-Islamic. There's no such thing as Tasawuf or Qadri Tariqa. And it's the same parallel to jurisprudence in the spiritual dimension because there's no religion in the world that began without a fundamentally spiritual impulse and imperative. The prophet had incredible spiritual power. And the power happened because Allah brought this power on him initially when in the Latul Qadr, when the Archangel Jibril embraced him three times increasingly tightly. What do we think this embrace was? It was a transfer of incredible spiritual power, which is why he was shaking for 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 weeks. You don't you don't shake out of fear for a week straight. You shake because it was it was the, the I mean those of us who have had spiritual experiences understand what happens when you when you when you do your dhikr and you go into a hell and that spiritual energy comes into you, people start shaking. Some people start crying. Why? Because there is this energy which comes from God. It's a spiritual energy. That energy is real. That energy is the fundamental locomotive of the spiritual experience. It is that which, which, which connects the human being to, 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 to his Lord and, cre and creator. And it is that which is the platform on which we then perform our religions and religious rites and practices. Religion started with that. The prophet began with that. Okay, as I tell my, my, my audiences, for the first nine years, there was no salah. The command to, 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 to do prayers was in the ninth year. The command to do the, the Ramadan, fast the month of Ramadan, in the 13th year. What did the prophet do for those first nine years? How did he, I mean, how did he, what was his attraction, his draw? It's that spiritual power. We call it the hymn of the spiritual master, the spiritual teacher. Muhammad had this in a very powerful way. Isa had it in a very powerful way that those who were in his, in his presence could, would, would, would like, you know, would, 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 would feel it. And it's that. It is, you told me a story of, of a, a non-Muslim person who, 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 who attended the uh, the uh, the uh, Zikr. and he came out like you know practically shaking. Okay, he was shaking because 
not only his foundation was shaken, but because he did, he he felt something, and that something aroused this 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 feeling in him. This is this is what this is what vikr is all about. This is what the energy that Sayyidina Jibril transferred to the Prophet was about. This is what the Prophet. This is what the Prophet. Uh, transmitted to his companions. That is why, in 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 the science of of spirituality, or what we call tasawwuf, which is the 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 science of of the ilm of of spirituality, as opposed to fiqh. Fiqh didn't exist as we understand it today at the time of the Prophet either. Do you know? Yeah. So the the idea of this 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 spiritual science and knowledge is 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 what it it, it tells us that. That in 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 the vocabulary of of tasawwuf, a sahib of Rasulullah is not just a contemporary. Abu Lahab was a contemporary. We don't consider him a sahabi, although yeah. he is in the tech in the language sense of the word. He was a sahabi of the Prophet. He was a contemporary of the Prophet. If you if you define it that way, but in 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 the language in the argo, the technology of uh, of, uh, of 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 tasawwuf. A sahib of Rasulullah is somebody who got this energy from Rasulullah. And it's that energy which opens your heart and, and makes you, you know, walk differently. And you, you, you feel this, this energy from Allah coming into you. And then from the, the presence, just the physical presence alone. That is why the embrace of this is what the embrace of rasulullah is this is what the bayah with the sheikh is this is what the the physical connection with the sheikh is in addition to that of course there is the transformation of knowledge that the, the Sayyidina jibril uh, taught the prophet and, and communicated with the prophet gave him the quran uh, gave him the um, the the choreography of our five time daily prayers so there's a lot of information transfer that happened between between uh, Saint Jibril and and the Prophet, the Prophet to his companion, passed on to his companions. So the 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 energy is there, and then the knowledge, which which the knowledge which then um, is uh, uh, is consistent with that energy, because there's knowledge which is against it. See, there's knowledge which is shaitani. There's knowledge which is which is consistent. In fact, one of my early lessons when I began on the spiritual path is to differentiate between an urge which is uh, divine, so to speak, and a, an urge which is shaitani. Mm -hmm. It can be the same urge. It can be love of a woman. It could be a desire for food. But one is, comes from the spiritual dimension, the, the, the good one, Another one comes from the shaitani dim dimension. And this is why, I mean, you, you can be angry for, for God and you can be angry for, for a shaitani reason. And this, this distinguishing is part of the, of the education of the human soul because the, we always are always learning, even in the spiritual realm, we're always learning. Just we're always learning even in the intellectual realm. Um, but those who ignore it completely, ignore it to their loss and also at very high risk. So, I mean, what you've just been saying has been blowing my mind, but uh, to bring it down to the earthly level. So where do you see, like, which aspects of the Quran do you think are more spiritually inspired? inspirational for you and uh, things that uh, if, if say uh, somebody who has not been exposed to the spiritual aspects of our faith would come to me and say Muqtadar, I want to read the Quran with you and take me through to the garden. It's like yes there are gardens but now you've been talking about the rose garden just show me where the rose garden is. show me the mystical and the spiritual side of the Quran. Uh, so which which chapters, which ayahs of the Quran that you consider are more spiritually inspirational? Even the whole book is uh, called, I mean, a spiritual uh, presence in, in this creation. Granted. But, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, so, look, uh, uh, 
the Quran itself distinct, makes a separation between verses which is called muhkamat and, and verses which is called, you know, uh, mutashabihat. Um, so there are, there are verses, you know, there are different, you can classify the verses of the Quran into several groupings. There are verses which are uh, purely legal verses, legalistic verses, you know. Uh, they have asked Rasulullah regarding the, you know, the lady who, you know, who, who has died and what to do with her estate and that kind of stuff. That's the whole bunches of things regarding, regarding laws, what to do in certain situations. That's one category. And um, uh, of course, they come from God, but the, uh, they, they, don't, they don't have the same power. In fact, a lot of the Medina and surahs tended to be of that because the Prophet was then building a community. Uh, but the first surahs, the earliest surahs to be revealed, have a certain rhythmic power, which even the Arabic was like very powerful to the Arabs of the time. It was very uh, seductive to the ear, which just pull their, their, their hearing um, in a way that was very powerful. And, and, um, and they could feel that this is not uh, a human author. They just knew it. You know, it's just like when you are, when you are an expert on literature, you can say, "Oh, this is this is a Shakespearean piece. This is a uh, you know a piece by you know uh, Ibsen, whatever." Or if you have a musical expert, so that sounds like a Bach piece. It sounds like a Mozart piece. I mean, you, you begin to 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 tell. Um, so, because the Arabs of the time of the Prophet were very sensitive to poetry and literary forms of words. They knew this is not the this this just could not be the work of a human being. That's why they accused him of being this is the work of a jinn. They they thought they they they, mm -hmm. they assumed it was a it was a jinn, but because they they knew it was not a human being for sure. But the question was, do you accept it as Allah speaking or not? Those who did, well and good. Those who did not ascribe it to a a, a jinn that was you know um, inspiring him with that. Um. But then you have verses like, you know, the, the light verse, Surah An-Nur, for example. Um, uh, the verses uh, which talk about, you know, in the creation of light at night and day and the alternation, you know, of, of the day are signs for those who, who understand. Yeah. Uh, all these verses which talk about the creation, the beauty of creation, um, have that. Now, th these verses are attractive by the virtue of their meaning. It wasn't until later that, that I learned, there's a learning process, there are some verses in the Quran which um, contain a lot of spiritual juice. Mm -hmm. okay? Like the word Allah. Repeating Allah makes people you know, it has an effect upon people. Saying, La ilaha illallah. Repeating it. as that same thing. Hayyu la ilaha illahu. Uh, ha has that feeling. So there are phrases and verses of the Quran which from a mental point of view may not sound as attractive as the poetry, poetry in the English sense of Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth, or in the alternation of night and day, you know, those beautiful passages about mm. creation, they somehow, yeah. they, they, they are very sweet to our, to our minds. But I also learned that, uh, this, this comes later, that there are verses in the Quran which have a spiritual punch. And when you repeat it, it give, has a spiritual impact upon you as well. But that, that is like a, almost like a, a different branch of knowledge, so to speak. Uh, and yeah. it comes from from uh, from familiarity with what we have called the, the the spiritual tradition of Islam, the Sufi tradition of Islam. I mean, Allah says in the Quran, "Fasaluhna dhikr in kuntum la ta'alamun." Ask the people of dhikr. If you look at the word dhikr and how it's used in many many situations and how it's differentiated, and I, I, I mean, dhikr is one of the most most complex words in the Quran. It is used to refer to the Quran itself. It's used to referring to remembrance. This is why uh, some servers have said that the, 
The vicar of the mind is fikr, is to mm -hmm. meditate and think. The vicar of the tongue is to repeat and chant the names of Allah. The vicar of the body is to do prayers and to fast. Oh, what do we have lovely company here? <laughs> uh, it's not she wants to join the vicar. <laughs> this is a Muslim cat. She joins us every time we pray. She comes running. Every time I start praying in this room, she comes running. I, I have to share a joke with you about my sister who, uh, who uh, you know, uh, uh, lives on a farm with her husband uh, in Virginia. And at one time they had a dog, a German Shepherd dog in the farm um, called Rodney. They named it Rodney. And her husband one day brought some cookies. And my sister said, oh, we can't have these cookies. It has lard in it. So her husband said, I'll give it to Rodney. She says, Rodney, he's a Muslim dog. How could he give it to him? <laughs> Let's try to understand the reality itself. See, this is why even in, you know, in, in my early days with the Sufis who talk about Sharia, um, uh, Tariqa, uh, Ma'rifa, and Haqiqa. Okay, mm -hmm. as, as if they're f as if four, four steps on the journey. Um, once at the level of the haqiqa, you, you, are, you are fully in line with the sharia, with the tariqa, and with ma'rifa. Because ma'rifa and the haqiqa is where it's at. You know, arifan, it is the personal knowledge of God. As you know, this is between arafa and alama. Alama means to know kind of intellectually, but arafa is to know personally. So yeah. it, we need to trans late our ilm of Allah into ma'rifah of Allah. And when you deal with the haqiqah, the reality of things, okay, it's different. It's like saying, are you a scholar of love or you're a lover? You know, are you a, 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 a repository of information, a scholar in that sense, or you a alim in the sense of a knower, a, a knower, a Gnostic, a person who, who knows God, who knows the Prophet, and a level of knowledge that, that suggests a relationship, a personal relationship. It's like a taxi driver who's been driving in a city for 30 years and somebody who's written a, a book on that city recently after doing one year worth of field work, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. You know, and, every nook and corner of the and experienced, right? Of that city, right? Mm -hmm. So it's 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 that and and um, and and what we need to teach our young, uh, uh, our up and coming Muslims, the next generation, is this heritage because we have a we have a very rich heritage, a very rich heritage in is in in our faith. I mean, when I began reading. The, uh, the, the, the books about Tasawwuf and the books, you know, by Rumi and, and, and the writings of, of uh, you know, Ibn Ata'illah and, and, and Suhra Wardi and all. I said, this is amazing stuff. It's amazing. I mean, how could the human mind conceive of these things? You know, you read Abu Yazid al-Bistami's writings and you just, you know, you just, your mind just goes into like, you know, into like, it, it, it's, it, it tries to get pushed into warp speed and fragments on the way. Okay. <laughs> and, 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 and you just, what did these guys get this? You know, this had to come from a feeling of, 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 of hadra, of presence with, with, with the reality. Um, you know, I've always been intrigued by the hadith of, um, I'm having seen it moments now in my, in my age, uh, who said, uh, the one who who, met, who who related a lot of the hadiths of the Prophet. Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira. Who said, I've, I've shared with you a lot of hadiths of the Prophet, but there's a group of hadiths if I shared with you, it would slit my throat. I've mm -hmm. always wondered, what hadith are those? What, are the, what was that that he, that he heard from the Prophet, which if he would share with people, they would kill him? I even heard said Abu Bakr also had had his own, had written his own collections of hadith. But after the Prophet yeah, died, he, bur he burnt it. So they say it what? was 500. I'm sorry? There were 500, they say. 
the one that Abu Bakr had, which he burned. Yeah. Um, thanks for letting me know about the, the number. But I, but when I when I when I think of that, it says why did he burn it? What information did the Prophet share with him? Abu Bakr burnt it. I mean, Abu Huraira lived, I think, longer than Abu Bakr. So you can say, well, those right. political issues that were on. But Abu, Abu Bakr was the first Khalifa. What was it that he felt he could not share with the Ummah? I don't know the answer to that. But obviously, well, obviously, there's knowledge which is, call it, secret, call it mystical, call it imprint, whatever you want. There's some kind of yeah. knowledge which these people felt had to be guarded and had to be protected. Yeah, it's like saying you can't handle the truth, right? Exactly. <laughs> to, 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 yeah. You have, yeah. To, you have to be at a certain level to be able to handle this kind of truth. Well, you know, I used to constantly wonder, you know, we know that all except uh, one tariqa, like the Naqshbandis go through Abu Bakr Siddiq uh, and the rest of them go through uh, Imam Ali uh, in their silsilas. So I used to wonder uh, why Abu Bakr? Uh, and when I read this, that he had a special collection of hadith, I immediately understood why the Naqshbandis Tariqa goes through him because that is where the transmission must have happened, right? He must have burned the text, but he must have shared them with some people. And so the silsila continues. Perhaps. I, I, I am not, I, I, I don't know enough about that to, to comment on it. But uh, the, the point that we are making here in general is that there is certainly a body of knowledge which the Prophet transmitted to his companions that they felt very reticent about sharing. And, um, and, and that information, yeah, it could be predictions about what would happen among the community, it could be, but it, there has to be something in there about, about, about the nature of, of the human spirit and soul, the nature of, between the, the, the human being and, and God. There had to be something there which was very powerful. Um, and, and, um, and God, in his mercy and in his generosity, does teach people information directly. I've seen it in my life. In my case, in the case of many people, people whom you may not even think of as being intellectually that have a very high IQ. Allah will give them a knowledge. I say, how do they know this? You know, it's like, uh, um, and they will say something that they receive from Allah, and it's the truth, undeniable truth. You know, I recently wrote a book about Ahsan, and the Prophet ﷺ described Ahsan as, أَنْتَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ To worship Allah as if you see him. And at first I used to, I remember it was in this room, I kept walking, I said, what does it mean to see God, to see God? And then I just realized that he had been on Miraj. So he actually meant it when he said, so he's able to relive his Miraj every time he's praying, right? So when, when the Prophet ﷺ is praying, he's as if he's in that moment where he is, uh, you know, beyond Bait al Mamur and he, he's able to experience that. So, so, so I think that is, that is the crux of the faith, isn't it? That we want to, like when we say die before you die, uh, is, is to be able to experience in this life what we are promised in the hereafter, that we will see the vision of God and we will communicate with God. And, and so to have this ayn al uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life, to me, that is the, the goal of the mystical path and the spiritual path. And how do we, I mean, this is my last question. How can we use the remaining days of, of Ramadan to at least begin our journey on that path? Well, I have, um, over the last few years, uh, spoken about what I called a God-centric perspective. Um, by that, I mean, is that 
um, we shift our point of vision or point of view. It's uh, an analogy I give is to what happened when people thought the earth was the center of the planetary system and the sun is a plant, a center of the planetary system. When, when you had the earth as a center, you could not calculate, you know, the, the planets seem to go in reverse sometimes, you know, and forward mm. sometimes. Uh, but once you put the sun at the center of the planetary system, then the equations of motions are all very easy to compute because it's, it's far more coherent. We tend to see things, including religion, from our worldly perspective, a self perspective, and we can't help it, it's understandable. The, the, the thing to try to achieve is to shift our perspective so you look at everything, including ourselves, from Allah's perspective. Look at all religion from Allah's perspective. Because that's the real perspective. In my younger days, I, th I sought it as the, what I call the Quranic perspective. What's the perspective of the Quran on this? And then after a while, I shifted it and reframed it as God's perspective. And of course, we learn God's perspective to a large extent from the Quran in our case. But when you look at it from the Quran's perspective, then, like I said, you, you, don't, you don't think of, you know, of, Judaism and Christianity and Islam as, as you know, Muhammad Inc., Moses Incorporated, and Jesus Incorporated. It's all about God Incorporated, and these are God's regional managers. That's what happens when you make that shift as far as, let's say, looking at religions. It's hard to make this step. Intellectually, you can try and imagine it. But when you have the spiritual experience of God, it makes it much easier because when you, when you have the, the experience of God, what happens is like, you know, as they say, when the sun comes out, the stars disappear. When you experience the reality of God, the boundaries of yourself disappear. And you experience a oneness with God. Now, I imagine that that the prophet's experience when he went to the very highest stage of the Mi'raj and met with God, of course, he had an experience analogous to that. So now imagine the prophet now feeling a sense of oneness with God. A oneness which explains to us the verses in the Quran where Allah says, it was not you who threw when you threw, it was Allah who threw. Then you become a servant of God in a more complete sense. So therefore, I mean, I even know the hadith, which we sort of describe a lot with the hadith Qudsi, where Allah says, when I love my servant, I become the eye by which he sees, the ear by which he hears, the hand by which he's, you know, grasped, etc. So you want to become, you become a channel for an energy from God, which flows from God. So you become, you become then an instrument of God. This is, this is what we, this is the ultimate that we, we try to achieve. And when you're in that state, you will have an impact upon people that you cannot even explain. They will be touched by what you say. Uh, they will feel something different. And that is, that is what the objective of our education has to be like that we become instruments of God, we become ibadullah in the more complete sense, to become a, a slave of God, so it become like, 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 and it's 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 in that state where 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 which describes the hadith of Prophet. He says, "The best of you are those who, when people see you, they think of Allah." Okay, or, or they see Allah, whatever the expression is. The idea is that, you know, they, they, they see in you a reflection. And that is what, if, if we believe that God created us in, our, in, in his image, ala surati, as, as Muslims and people of the book believe, then this is what we mean by polishing your mirror so that each of us 
is a, is a potential reflector of God. And the more perfectly you polish your mirror, the more perfectly you are a mirror, not only that you have rust on your thing, but even some mirrors, you know, which make you look funny and, and, mm-hmm. and, 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 and so sort of like twist the shape. Uh, so the same thing, if you reflect a lost light, in a way that twists a lot of reality out of shape. I mean, a lot of people reflect God that way or don't reflect it at all. You don't see the light of God. So these are all metaphorical uh, images or figurative ways to describe something which is very real, very, very real. And at the end of the day, that is the, that is the ultimate bliss that any human being can experience. Imam Faisal Rauf, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom with us and enlightening us. I've heard you so many times that every time I listen to you, I move to the core, not just intellectually, but also spiritually. So thank you very much for, for all the wonderful thoughts. It will take a long time for us to process. And I hope uh, that uh, those who are listening to this uh, also uh, find uh, both the uh, spiritual satisfaction uh, and intellectual illumination from this conversation. Thank you very much. My dear brother, Professor Mokhtar, it's been my, my pleasure indeed and my honor to, to be with you. You know how much love and affection and respect I have for you. And, um, and I'm grateful to you indeed. And it's been a, a special blessing doing it uh, in this month of Ramadan, the month of Natal Qadr, the month of the revelation of the Quran, uh, the month of our fasting, uh, and uh, and uh, the month in which we look forward uh, to the, the, the special reward that Allah promises us when He said that we'll have two pleasures when we break our fast and when we meet our Lord in the hereafter. And um, I sense in our discourse the pleasure of God. So I'm Thank grateful. You very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.